All right. So this is our uh, weekly uh, lecture series at Rockland Public Library. I'm Shane, the Adult Program Coordinator. I thank you for joining us this evening. As always, I want to start by thanking the friends of Rockland Public Library for their wonderful support of our programming throughout the year, both virtual um, and on site. And I would like to also thank our library director, Amy Levine, who made sure we were set up uh, very quickly with the Zoom capability once we had to transition to virtual programming. So uh, tonight's presentation is Catherine Owen. She is a park ranger and she is going to be uh, giving a talk. Before I introduce Catherine, I would like to tell you about a couple of upcoming programs here at Rockland Public Library. Next Thursday, September 17th, we're going to be welcoming David Yarborough, and he is going to be giving a lecture on the uh, Maine's wild blueberry industry. David Yarborough is the Emeritus Wild Blueberry Specialist with Cooperative Extension and Emeritus Professor of Horticulture in the School of Food and Agriculture at the University of Maine, where he worked for 40 years. He's going to give a presentation describing the establishment of the wild blueberry plants as the glaciers receded 10,000 years ago. And he'll discuss the beginnings of the blueberry industry in the 1800s. You won't want to miss this informative talk. That's next Thursday on Zoom um, at 6.30 p.m. And in two weeks on Thursday, September 24th, we will be welcoming journalist and radio host Ainsel Ponty. She is from the Portland Press Herald and she is going to be talking about the impact of the pandemic on live music in Portland. She's also going to be giving us an overview of her career as a journalist and radio host and talking about some of her favorite albums of 2020. If you're interested in either of these talks, please uh, send me an email at sbillings at rocklandmaine.gov and I will make sure you get the link to attend. So now to introduce tonight's speaker, Catherine Owen. She is the new park ranger at Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. She's going to be giving us an overview tonight of what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does and more specifically the preservation and protection work being performed by Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. Catherine Owen is an Illinois native. She attended the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, where she studied fish and wildlife conservation. After graduating from college, Catherine started a long journey of seasonal work, doing outdoor education and interpretation up and down the east coast of the United States. She accepted her first federal job with the National Park Service in the Outer Banks of North Carolina, where she spent four years, and she followed this with a spring season in Yellowstone National Park before finding her way to Maine and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. At the end of Catherine's talk, there will be a question and answer session. Uh, you'll need to use the chat box, but if you're afraid of forgetting your question, type it in anytime. We'll make sure we get to all of your questions. Catherine loves to educate people on what they can find in their very own backyard. So without further ado, let's please give a nice virtual welcome to Catherine Owen. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. Um, it's been a little while since I've given a program, so don't mind me if I'm a little rusty. You got to shake it off a bit um, in these trying times that we have, but I'm excited that there's enough of you to kind of talk. Um, like Shane said, the chat box is open if you have any questions throughout the program, but also I will ask questions throughout the program. Feel comfortable answering them in the chat box. It kind of helps the program move along and create a discussion. I'm not here just to talk at you. I want to inform you guys, but also get you excited about your public lands, specifically um, wildlife refuges, which a lot of people don't know a lot about. 
Um, but to kind of get a little feel for things, being that I'm in Maine right now, but because this is virtual and we shared it on our Facebook, there's a variety of people from all over the country, hopefully, in this. So I'm curious as to where some of you are from, even if you aren't even just from Rockland. It'd be nice to know where up and down the coast of Maine you're from. So if you want to drop in the chat box where you're from, it kind of helps me get an understanding of what you might know. Um, while you're kind of out and about out here. So we got people from Camden, which is just up the road. Oh, we got St. Louis. Okay, that's near me. Maryland. So we got people um, that are all up and down all around, which makes it really nice to kind of interact with folks because normally if this was a normal season, you might be out and about maybe traveling and visiting these areas. And if you're visiting wildlife refuges, the um, shield that you see right now on the screen is also the same shield that's on my uniform. And then the blue goose, those are common logos that you might see. But I've also created a nice background behind me throughout this program. So even though you're sitting at home, you might be visiting these islands with me. And that's what makes Maine Coastal Islands so unique. But to kind of kick it off, again, I am a park ranger, but where is the park that I work at? I don't actually work at a park. Park. I'm working at a wildlife refuge, which is different from the National Park Service. The Fish and Wildlife Service, yes, is still under the same branch as the Department of the Interior and the National Park Service, but I like to think that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is kind of the lesser known cousin of the Park Service. People don't really know about us. They don't know what we do, but we're the same idea of public lands and that we want people to get out and enjoy them. And Shane did a nice introduction of where I've been. So I've worn different uniforms and different hats throughout my time. But right now I'm working for the US Fish and Wildlife Service and that refuge system. And my job is a park ranger or a park interpreter, but I don't actually speak any other languages, at least not well. Um, I can try a little, but we don't need to test out my language skills. I interpret the resource. So if you go to any wildlife refuge visitor center, or if you go to a park service site, you will meet a park interpreter. We're the frontline folks that love to talk about what's in your backyard and what you're seeing. And that's exactly why I'm here today, is to talk about all of that awesome stuff that's in your backyard. And that's what makes the wildlife refuge system really unique. Because um, my job is not the only one that's present here in the wildlife refuge system. We have biologists that are doing all the research. So like I said, I interpret the resource. So the biologists do all the busy work out in the field and the important, cool, interesting, dirty work. And then they bring me that information and I get to share it with folks like you all. And that way then I don't have to get all dirty and gross. I get to just talk about really cool stuff and look really cool in the process. These nice uniforms, if you didn't notice. But then we also have law enforcement because we want to make sure that folks stay safe when visiting our refuges. And we also have a refuge manager, similar to like a superintendent of a national park. So they're in charge of the overall sort of function of the refuge and maybe managing things like lighthouses. So we do have a few lighthouses here at the Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. We also have maintenance workers. So we have folks in all different departments that help to keep this system running which is pretty cool. And the wildlife, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, although it has the title of a park ranger for my job, we manage different things like refuges, fish hatcheries, and this system is pretty big. So if you have ever visited a wildlife refuge, maybe you can drop it in the group chat of ones you've been to. There are over 540 wildlife refuges, meaning that there's one in almost every state. So those of you that live in the main mid coast Maine area, you have one right in your backyard. It's a little far offshore, but we do have mainland locations. But anywhere across the country, even just in the continental US, like you see in my photo here, there's one in almost every state. And that's because we're covering tons and tons of acres to try to protect these lands. And these numbers, the 500, over 540 wildlife refuges stretch to Alaska and Hawaii and even submerged ones like your marine sanctuaries. So we even have one of those off the coast of Maine. And these are all really important because they all tie into what the mission of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is. And that's to administer a national network of lands and waters for the conservation, management, 
and where appropriate restoration of the fish, wildlife, and plant resources and their habitats within the United States for the benefit of present and future generations of Americans. So the idea of the refuge system in US Fish and Wildlife Service is to preserve and protect these lands and the resources that are within them to hopefully have successful communities. And that way then folks like you and me and anyone else in your neighborhood can go out and visit these refuges. You notice along the East Coast, it's pretty, pretty heavily dotted. We have a lot of urban refuges, which means they are literally in your backyard. So it's not hard to get out and to visit some of these wildlife refuges. But today, I'm not gonna talk about the ones that are in all of your backyards. I'm gonna talk about the one that I work at, which is Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. And we're actually a complex of refuges. So we're not just one location snap, like drop down in the middle of Maine. We are multiple locations. And so this map here shows you a collection of the islands and the mainland locations that the refuge manages. So we own these islands. We own these mainland locations. If you look really closely at the map, we have our Rockland office, which is where I'm at. But right now it looks like I'm hanging out on one of the islands. But the Rockland office, we also have an office up in Millbridge, so about two and a half hours north of where I am up the coast. So we have a lot of locations, but then if you are adventurous and you have a boat and you're going in the right time of year, or even if you do some of the tours off of the coast, they'll take you along near some of these islands that we protect out here. And so it's interesting to think about what we're protecting and how the Fish and Wildlife Service initially came into play. And so the wildlife, the wildlife refuge system was established by Theodore Roosevelt, and he established that first one in Florida at Pelican Island National Bird Reservation. So I saw someone said that they like to go to Ding Darling, which is also one of those Florida locations of our wildlife refuge system. So again, it's not just in Maine that we have them. But if it hadn't been for Theodore Roosevelt, we probably wouldn't have all of these protected lands out here, just like Maine Coastal Islands. But looking at this map, there's quite a few small dots and lines running up and down it. And those dots and lines are representing over 70 islands. Whew, that's a lot of islands to try to manage, especially with so much land to cover. But Maine actually has over 4,600 islands off the coast. We have more coastline than California. I know it's hard to imagine. If you're not from the East Coast, Maine doesn't seem very big. It doesn't seem like it has a lot of coastline, but it's got more than California. And that's because of those islands and all those inlets and those nooks and crannies that head up into the elbows of Maine. But thinking about those 70 islands, those mainland tracks that we have, they stretch from the New Hampshire border all the way up to the Canada border. So we are covering the entire coast of Maine and we are protecting lands, we are protecting birds, we are protecting species and plants and things in hopes of making a better habitat environment for the future, which these days seems like quite a thing to protect. And that is over 8,000 acres of diverse marine habitat. Again, we are a coastal refuge, so we're looking at all that marine habitat out here that is being protected. And 8,000 acres, it's quite a bit of land to cover. So maybe some areas might be more focused on than others and they might have more visitation, but not by people. Um, out here, they get visited by other living organisms. But the focus of the refuge out here and what we tend to spend most of our time on are our seabirds. And we'll talk a little bit about what a seabird is and what makes it so unique and why these islands need to be protected for these seabirds and why the seabirds themselves need to be protected. But how did we get all these islands? Because if you know any history about the coast of Maine, at some point, these islands had people living on them. They had camps on them. They were visiting them in the summer. They were visiting them in the spring. They were visiting them at other times by boat before cars and manifest destiny sent us out west. We are spending all of our time in these coastal environments and our coastal environments happen to be in places like we are or where I am right now. But how did we get these lands? Some of them have been donated to the refuge system. Some have been bought. But where do we get the money? How do we pay for these? Well, because we are a federal agency, Congress does a lot of money for us. And then also the Migratory Bird um, Conservation Fund 
Also, that is replenished through the duck stamp. So if there's any waterfowl hunters out there, you probably know a little bit about the duck stamp and the money from the duck stamp. A large portion of it goes back to the wildlife refuge system. So we are part of that overarching system that covers over 540 locations. But another new act that came in this year was the Great American Outdoors Act. And that provides funding for deferred maintenance and also for acquisition of land. So that's something good for all public lands, not just the wildlife refuge system, but all public lands. And that will allow for money to be um, put towards things that need to be fixed at refuges, at parks, at BLM locations, and also will allow for more land to be set aside and protected, which is always important. We wanna make sure that we're keeping these lands safe Again, for those future generations, if we built on all of them, we wouldn't really have much to leave for our future. But these refuges, like I said, are out here to protect for seabirds, like this one you see behind me. But why do we need to protect for seabirds? Why would we need to protect for them? What might have happened in the past that led to us needing to protect seabirds? I mentioned earlier that a lot of people spent most of their time along the coast. And so seabirds are a colonial bird, which means they nest in large groups. So for them, their idea is safety in numbers. For someone who is hungry, it means there's plenty of them around to catch. So seabirds were historically hunted off the coast of Maine. You could come up to some of these islands and see hundreds and thousands of these colonial seabirds nesting or hanging out on these islands or close to them. So it made for easy pickings. And so egging was a big thing and that's not what kids do on Halloween where they go around and throw eggs at everyone's houses. It's actually where you go and hunt for eggs out here along the coast to find different things. And the way it worked was if you'd pull up to an island, you'd see all these nests that already have eggs in them and you don't know when they were laid so you're not looking to have a fresh puffin fried in your egg, you're looking to have an egg. So you'd come through, you'd mark a nest, you'd smash the eggs, and then you'd come back in a few days for the turns, for the gulls, and you would collect the eggs that were newly laid. So now you don't have any kind of embryo that's being developed inside of your egg. So egging was a big thing, killing large populations, because a lot of these birds, your turns, your gulls, they can, they can lay another nest if one's been destroyed, lost, or ruined, if it's still early enough in their breeding season. So the hunters were able to get out there. And again, they were also hunting them just for collecting the birds. So in other countries to this day, they might still eat puffins. You might see them on a fancy menu, but it was easy to hunt birds that were in larger populations, like these colonial nesting birds. And another one, um, if anyone wanted to have status back in the day, in the turn of the century. Status would come through in the form of fashion. And so that fashion coming through came through in millinery, which is hats. So you can see in these two photos, these women had almost whole birds on their heads. And so these hats, you'd go out, you'd hunt. The more feathers you had, the bigger the bird, the prettier the feather, the higher in society people felt you were. So that was another big thing. And that almost led to the near demise of the seabird populations or the almost elimination of them. And as people continued to move westward, maybe a little bit of pressure was taken off these islands. But the Migratory Bird Act of 1918 actually put in a lot of restrictions and safety for these migratory birds. Seabirds are migratory because in their name, it doesn't mean they spend all time on these islands because they're not called island birds, they're called seabirds. And the Migratory Bird Act protected for their nests and their eggs and the lands that they used. And so that protection coming in in 1918 kind of led to women maybe not wearing these hats full of full birds all the time. And some of the populations of gulls began to return and other populations started to make their way. But it wasn't until the Audubon Society and the Wildlife Refuge System really stepped in to up their research and to up their protection um, sort of management practices. And so the Wildlife Refuge out here at Maine Coastal Islands does a lot of management. 
and a lot of protection for these seabirds. And their research takes you all over and there are a few species of focus that we have and ones that we see more commonly, um, including a common tern, which is in our upper right corner. And then you have your roseate tern, which is actually an endangered species. And then you have your Arctic tern. So these are the three tern species that we see commonly out here off of our islands. And again, they're colonial seabirds. So they nest in these large groups in large numbers. And it makes, sometimes it can be safe for them being that they're in large numbers and they can help each other out finding foraging areas, but it can also be dangerous because it means that disease can spread quickly. They're a bigger target and easier to find from predators. But a bonus to living on these islands or to nesting on these islands is that there are very few mammal predators on these islands. So it's hard to find maybe a raccoon or a possum or something that might eat their eggs. But there are other birds out there that will eat these smaller birds. So some of your gulls are much larger and they're kleptivores. So they'll eat anything they can get their hands on. And so that means they're either stealing chicks, they're stealing eggs, or they're stealing food right out of your mouth if you were another bird. So <laughs> those terns can live a little bit harder of a life. So our biologists, and in the summer, our interns are out there collecting data. You notice the roseate tern in the middle has two little anklets on its ankles, and those are field bands. And so that allows for biologists and researchers to re-identify that bird later on. And that allows for them to see maybe where they've traveled, if they've been on this island before, if they've been back here multiple years. So do they keep returning to the same location, which the hope is that they do keep returning to the same location. But seabirds don't spend all of their time on these islands. Their name suits them because they spend most of their time out at sea. So some of the other seabirds that we also study out here are your Atlantic puffins in the upper left corner. The really regal looking ones are your razor bills. And then you have your black guillemots, which are the one, which is the one in the bottom with its mouth wide open. And so these seabirds spend almost all of their life out at sea. So that means that they're in cold, harsh environments. They're in open water, so they're pretty exposed. So they have webbed feet to help them kind of kick up out of the water. Some of their wing shapes allow for them to dive deeper into the water column to find food. But the only time that they really return to land is to breed, but that takes a little while. So once they've laid a nest and had babies, they spend a lot of time training these babies and these chicks to then go on and travel and to be a part of the migration and to survive. But they spend more time training them and then in a few years, so those new chicks that are heading out to sea right now and started kind of heading out last month, they might not return to these islands for a few years. So what could happen in a few years if, they're, if they want to return to these islands? There's a lot that could happen. And so thinking about these seabirds, there's a lot of things. Odds are kind of stacked against them. But again, they are a migratory bird and so our Arctic terns uh, have one of the longest migrations. They are called Arctic terns because they do spend a portion of their season in the Arctic. And yeah, we might be close to the Northern Arctic, but they actually migrate all the way down to Antarctica. So they will breed up here off the coast of Maine, and then they will head all the way down to their wintering area, which is in red here on the map. So if you're looking at it, they spend a lot of time off the coast of Greenland up here, and then they head all the way down. So they're traveling about 40,000 miles. And again, they aren't much bigger than kind of my face across. So they're not very big birds, but they're traveling very, very long distances. So that can also put a lot of pressure on them because in that long time that they're traveling, they are stopping off at locations along the way. What kind of troubles can they run into? Again. These are all kind of foreshadowing of why the refuge is out here and why they're trying to protect because there's a lot of current effects on these seabirds that can really make it difficult for them to continue survival. But the Gulf of Maine 
is a great place to have these seabirds coming in. It's a really productive area. But to get maps like this, so we can understand maybe where the birds are foraging or where they are wintering and traveling to, they will get little geotags put on them. And so they're just sutured on and it'll give data points and create maps like what we just had after the biologists sort of run through and analyze all that data of where these birds are traveling to, or maybe even where they're foraging. So thinking about the Gulf of Maine, and it being in an extremely productive area. And that's because of its unique shape and its location along the coast, on the Atlantic coast. And so looking at the currents that come through Maine and off the coast of Maine and even all the way down to the Cape, you're getting cold, cold water from that Arctic. But then the warm water does come fairly far off our coast and there's a good mix. So you can kind of see those arrows are kind of showing that mix because the water is cold out here in the Gulf of Maine, that means there's lots of phytoplankton. And phytoplankton, those are those initial starting points of food webs. And so the moment that the temperature changes in the Gulf of Maine, you now throw off an entire food web. And so if you have species like your seabirds that are relying on a specific type of fish that then eats a specific type of plankton that's in the waters, then you might not end up actually seeing those birds out here. Or we get our seabirds that are collecting a different type of fish to feed their chicks on these islands because it's all they can get their beaks on, not their hands. And so they're looking for these less popular species of fish. Maybe they're too big, harder for the chicks to swallow. So now the chicks aren't getting proper nutrients. And that's something that can happen because of temperature change. So a slight temperature change in the Gulf of Maine can throw off an entire ecosystem, an entire food web of how these seabirds survive. So at the Wildlife Refuge, we can't be out there with ice cubes making sure that the Gulf of Maine stays cold, but we can make sure that these islands stay as pristine as possible. And so on a lot of these islands, we have them closed to the public during certain seasons. And so this sign is telling folks that there is a nesting area on this island and that you can't actually land on these islands during our nesting season. And that way it keeps those birds a little more protected, a little less human interaction. And our biologists, our interns are out on these islands for 12 to 14 weeks at a time in the summer. And they are just diligently collecting data, reading information, seeing which birds are returning, and in hopes that we have productive years. Because a productive year, can hopefully lead to multiple productive years because we can't really see what will happen the next year from the year before. Yes, we could have tons and tons of chicks born, but they won't return for a few years to lay another nest. And like I said, what could happen in a few years? Temperatures could change in the Gulf, islands could become developed, seawater levels could rise, and now those rocky shorelines could change to where some of these birds enjoy those rocky beaches, those rocky shorelines, now they're not exposed as often. So it makes it difficult for these birds to nest as our natural environment changes due to human impact. And so it's something for all of us to think about as we continue on in our everyday life. Yeah, you might not live along the coast of Maine, but all of these wildlife refuges within the system are protecting for different species species. Go to them, visit, see what they're protecting and why, because it gives you a sense of what's important and what could then in the long run affect us. Because if we completely eliminate different areas or different habitats or different environments, we're affecting ourselves in the long run too. Mother Nature can adapt and is very resilient. Humans sometimes have a little problem adapting a little bit better and we think that everything should adapt to us. So it does make living a little bit harder sometimes. But what happens if these birds lose all these lands? Again, we only own 70 of these islands and they only nest on a few of them. But if they get less and less habitat, what's gonna happen to them? Where are they gonna go? What's gonna happen to their species? And then again, those food webs all get knocked off. But I don't wanna leave this all on doom and gloom because I wanna make sure that I can answer any questions that you guys might have that maybe came up throughout this program. But I want you guys to kind of go home with the idea of what can you do for your part 
And if you live in the Rockland or Maine area, um, or even if you just want to visit the website, our friends group is a great resource for volunteering and donating and just kind of being a part of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. But you can also find friend groups for other refuges out there that are closer to home. Go out and visit them. Now is the time to visit your public lands and to really be a part of that. Um, a lot of refuges and fish hatcheries look for volunteers. So you can always volunteer if it's closer to home. Um, but share this information with people. The idea of public lands and places like the Wildlife Refuge System is for you all to get out into your backyards and to enjoy nature. So take it in, go on a hike, take a camera with you, or even just stop and listen to the wildlife around you depending on where you go. And make sure that when you are recreating that you're leaving no trace. So take only pictures, leave only footprints, and make sure that you all are recreating responsibly um, also, for us here at Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge, feel free to follow us on Facebook. We're always updating with different information um, out here that we're doing and things that are happening out on the islands or has happened out on the islands. Um, also in October is Wildlife Refuge Week, so it's a great time to get out to your refuges and really support them or even support them virtually like this. This is the great thing about how quickly we adapted to something new is we all now can use Zoom or Skype or whatever video platform. Um, we'll hopefully be going live at some point during Wildlife Refuge Week. So that is October 11th through the 17th. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and if you guys have any questions that throughout this time, if I can't answer, I will also leave my email in the chat box. So that way you guys can um, ask any questions that you might have if I didn't answer them now. But I think I'll turn it over to Shane to kind of manage some questions. Okay. So. Let's see what we have. Um, to start with, Catherine, we did have a comment come through that said um, that the Roseate Turns also visit the Dry Tortugas National Park in Florida. We have a question um, from the audience what have you enjoyed most about working at this refuge? Um, so this is my first refuge, so can I just say I've enjoyed it all? But I enjoy the aspect that it's something completely new and different. Um, I've experienced some seabirds and shorebirds, being that I lived up and down the East Coast in North Carolina. But I mean, the first time I saw a puffin, I was almost in tears. <laughs> so it's been an amazing experience just to know that there is so much conservation going on off the coast of Maine that nobody knows about. There are so many islands that I couldn't see them all in the time that I'm here. And to know that what <laughs> we have here at the refuge and the practices that we're doing. It's just amazing to know that there are so many passionate people just within this refuge system. Excellent. Uh, the next question from the audience, where is the closest refuge to Chicago? That is a great question. That one came from someone not around here. If you go to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so fws.gov, you should be able to find refuges that are near you. Um, there should be some up there, probably some urban refuges. I'm not positive. Again, there's over 540 of them. I can't name them all. <laughs> but I would say go to fws.gov to see maps of the ones that are, that map that I showed, that first slide of all the maps. Um, on their website, that's actually an interactive map. So you can click up near Chicago to see those. Okay, uh, next question, Catherine. Um, have you been out on the islands and what was the most exciting and surprising things that you have seen? I have been out to one of the islands. It was Matinic and it was the first few weeks I was here and the staff warned me, they're like, make sure you have a hat. And in my mind, I was like, my head's not made for hats. I don't own one. And I was confused as to why I needed a hat. And I get out to the island and we're walking out to the colonies and I was glad I had a hat. I went home with some bruises on my head because the birds, um, the terns were all kind of dive bombing because at that point you're walking around their nests and they're trying to protect them. So they are going to try to do anything they can to protect them. Um, and so that was really cool. And also just, it's, um, 
like a scavenger hunt when you're in these turn colonies. So you kind of look three times, take one step, look three times, take one step, because there's so many nests around you and they're so well camouflaged that you don't want to accidentally step on one of them. So that was out on Matinic, which is one of the closer ones to here to Rockland. And it was just cool to <laughs> just to get out there and see what the interns were doing. I commend them 12 to 14 weeks showering out of a bag, minimal electricity, drinking water out of jugs. Um, it's definitely something that <laughs> I don't think I would personally do, but I'll take their research and share it with everyone else. All right. Um, FWS protects seabirds in Maine, but what about the fish portion of their mission? So at least Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge does not focus on fish, but the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so the Wildlife Refuge System is a branch underneath the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so the shield and then you have the blue goose kind of branch underneath it. And there are fish hatcheries. A lot of them are out on the West Coast in like Oregon and Washington, and they do salmon research, but there are also fish hatcheries um, along here. And I know that in a lot of other areas, they'll have ponds that they do research. I mean, Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge is just south of us in Virginia. Um, so there are a lot that do birds because a lot of this was set aside to protect migratory birds. But there are fish hatcheries under Fish and Wildlife Service. There's, again, like I said, the um, marine sanctuaries, those are all underwater. So fish are definitely involved in those as well. Fish, lobster, grasses, all that good stuff. Excellent. Is there an annual bird count done within the refuge? There is. So they, um, they do an annual census. I am not a part of that because my job is to run the visitor center and to talk about what they're doing, but they also then are collecting all of the data from the islands. And so I know that this year, Matinic Island and another one associated had some of their highest um, breeding pairs or nests in a while, like over a thousand nests of terns, which is really cool. It was one of the highest numbers they've had in a while, but they do censuses out on the islands closer to like June when the bulk of all the seabirds have arrived. So they'll kind of start arriving in May and then they'll kind of leave to start their migration in August. So it's a short period that they're out here, but there is research done on that. And if you go to our website, so I can also drop that in the chat, but the main coastal islands, fish and wildlife service, .gov website, we have past research on there or of sort of an overall of how the season went with seabirds. Uh, the next question, Catherine, is how can we help children come to know and protect our seabirds? Education, education, outreach, education. Um, that is a great question. If there's any educators here in the program today or no people that know teachers, um, we are offering virtual field trips. So it's an opportunity for teachers and students to zoom in and to visit the island seabirds and hang out with me for a little bit and learn just like you all did today. Um, our visitor center does offer a children's program and it's a immersive island experience but without actually having to get on a real boat and so we <laughs> are able to offer those as well to teachers when we are open. Obviously right now because of COVID, we are not, but it definitely is an opportunity. Share what you learned here today, tell people about us. The more we can get out, the better. Um, and I think the more conservation efforts we can share with children, the better. They are our future. At this point, we've gone too far. <laughs> so we need to make sure that they're educated. Was there a particular seabird about which you knew absolutely nothing until you started your work? I had no idea that razor bills existed. <laughs> so when I first got ready to move out here, I watched a few videos and I went to the website and I have friends that are avid birders, but more southern birders. And 
I, a razor bill. Sounds cool, looks cool, they look super prestigious. Knew nothing about them and the more that I've learned, um, they're the closest related to the extinct auk, which is a species that unfortunately went extinct, but they're the closest related to them. So you kind of learn fun facts about that and they're just an interesting, cool looking bird that who knew they existed before I moved out here. <laughs> Uh, the next question from the audience is, do puffins taste like chicken? <laughs> I wouldn't know. It's illegal to kill them and eat them. Um, I'm sure they are a, they're a bird. <laughs> I feel like most birds taste the same. But if you think about it, these seabirds are spending a lot of time in their cold environments. So they might have a little more fat on them like a duck. So you never know but you'd have to go to a foreign country to try them. Do you have any particular books on birding that you would recommend to a beginner? To a beginner, that is a great question. I took ornithology in college. Let's see if we have a copy of it. Hold on one second. So just your basic bird guides. Peterson does one, Silby does one, but they have locations. But you also don't need a book. Cornell Lab does amazing apps that you can download on your phones. And so you can download um, Cornell's birding app. And you can literally, it'll pick up your location on your phone and you can say, I saw a medium sized bird that was green and it was in a bush and it'll give you options. It'll also give you sounds, so different calls that you might've heard. And that is probably a great beginner app to put on your phone, on your tablet, and just check it out. It's Cornell Labs, um, just birding app. It's great. <laughs> it's, it's an easy thing for beginners to use because you start recognizing like, maybe that wasn't a medium sized bird, maybe that was a small bird based on your experiences you're out and you can use it in your backyard. Test it out with like a robin or a cardinal and see if you get to the answer by using their sort of algorithm. So that's a good one to use and you don't have to carry around a heavy book. Uh, the next question, I understand there are puffin colonies along the cliffs in Norway. Do ours migrate eastward and vice versa? Yeah, so that's the cool thing is that those are all Atlantic puffins. And puffins are a little lazy about their migration. Um, so like our terns, they have a specific location in mind when they go to winter, but our puffins, they tend to head out to a location, hang out. They're kind of drifters. So the ones that are along the coast of Norway um, definitely are the exact same species that we have out here. They're all Atlantic puffins. But if you head to like Alaska, in the Pacific Northwest, you're going to get the, a different species of puffin than what you might see on the coast of Norway. Excellent. Do we have any final questions for Catherine Owen? And Catherine, can you again tell uh, the audience how they can get in touch with you if they think of further questions? Yes, yeah, so I will put my email in the chat box. If you all have further questions or if you know any educators that are looking for free field, virtual field trips, you can also share my email with them if you enjoyed this program. Obviously, if you didn't enjoy it, don't go telling them. Um, but there's my email. So if you come up with any more questions and also our Facebook, so if you go to Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge on Facebook, you can message us on there, comment on our posts, and it's definitely a way to get in contact with us because um, our visitor center is not open. Well, we want to thank you so much, Catherine, and the thank yous are starting to come into the chat box. Thank you so much, says an audience member. Very interesting. See you in Rockland sometime. Uh, thanks, Kate. Great overview. And I learned a lot. Now I want to go back to Maine. That's great. <laughs> Well, on behalf of Rockland Public Library, thank you for joining us for our weekly program series. It was a privilege to have you. Uh, thanks for a what fun webinar, says another audience member, and thanks for helping wildlife. Great program, many thanks. 
uh, thank you, thank yous are rolling in, and we thank you, and you will be able to um, catch Catherine's talk on the Rockland Public Library Facebook page and YouTube channel in the near future, and um, hopefully one day we will have you on site for a live, a live program. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> thank you for your time and your expertise. It was our pleasure, and I would like to wish you all a safe and good evening. Take good care. Thanks for joining us tonight. Goodbye, everyone. Yay.